And for sake of time this morning, I'm, I'm just going to read our, our one phrase here, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Would you say that with me? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Father, today I pray that you would speak through your servant in such a way that would stir up our church and your church and your people to be the peacemakers that our world needs. I pray today that you would convict, challenge, encourage, and uplift each and every heart that's here. May everyone hear what the Spirit has to say. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Blessed are the peacemakers. Did you know um, my house these days does not have a whole lot of peace? <laughs> In fact, last night as I was finalizing my sermon, my poor wife, I can. At times, at times, I heard her run across the, the upstairs, and uh, you could hear, I'm down in the basement, and you could hear, bum, 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 bum. <laughs> and uh, now we know we can figure out every different cry. We know each one has their own cry, and we can tell who it is, and, um, but uh, how many know that when you had your, how many have ever had little babies in the house? Sometimes it's hard to find peace. Because <laughs> they're growing, and they're fussy, and they want their way. We also live in a world full of a bunch of infants who are fussy. <laughs> and who want their way. Since 3600 BC, the world has only known 292 years of peace. This is, this is from a study from the Norwegian Academy of Sciences and Historians. This is, only, this is less than 8% of the time has our world experienced peace. During that, that period, during this period, there have been 14,351 wars large and small, in which 3.64 billion people have been killed. Wow. The value of property destroyed through war would pay for a golden belt around the world that's 97.2 miles wide and 33 feet thick. And here's a neat one. There has been in excess of 8,000 peace treaties that have been broken. I don't think it's any news to us that we live in a world that gives us a lot to worry about. I mean, you don't have to go too far. You know, a hundred years ago, <clears throat> A tragedy could have happened way over on the other side of the world, and you would have never heard about it for, for months and months and months, or if you, you might not have even ever heard about it. But now, every terrorist threat, every earthquake, every tsunami, every global crisis, every political problem, every single thing that goes on in the world, we hear about it like that. It either comes on our phone through an app, it either comes through an alert on our computer, or we're sitting watching TV and you can choose from a huge number of, of news channels that you can watch and they can tell you about everything that you need to have fear about, worry about, and be anxious about. Right? Peace these days is pretty hard to come by in a world where there is a heightened awareness of everything that takes away peace. Can I say that again? Peace is pretty hard to come by in a world that is heightened by an awareness of everything that takes peace away. 
So here's my, my sermon's three, threefold here this morning. I want to talk about the importance of making peace. I want to talk about the process of making peace. And I want to talk about the reward or the result of making peace. Because how many want to be blessed? Right? Jesus said, blessed are they who are peacemakers. So let's talk about the importance of making peace. And let's start with just two questions. First of all, let's start with the question, what is peace? And then I want to ask the question, what is a peacemaker? Question number one, what is peace? It comes from the word Irene. Irene in the Greek. It means six, uh, it, it means six things, but I'm just going to tell you five things, okay? It means rest, it means order, it means harmony, it means security, and it means quietness. So peace has a, a multifaceted meaning. Many look for peace in all the wrong places, don't they? They look it for it in, in, in their relationships. They look, at, look for it in money. They look for it in power. They look for it in position. They look for it in popularity. They think all of those things. Some people think that if they have the right clothes, if they drive the right car, if they have more money, if they, have, if they could be athletic, and they, they look for, you know, I'm at peace when I can sit at a football game and eat some pizza and watch the Steelers crush the New England Patriots. You know, people think that that is peace. Some people look for peace in pop. And the truth is, I wouldn't doubt if there might be a few of you here in the room that think you can find peace with pop. I'm talking marijuana. And I'm, and I'm not saying that to convict anybody or try to send anybody to jail. But the truth is, is some people, even in the church, think it's okay to smoke marijuana because it makes them calm down. I, 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 I talk to people who come to church that think that. Alcohol. Smoking a cigarette. Sex. Some people look for peace in who they are, what they do, where they live. They're looking for peace in all the wrong places, aren't they? Because the Bible talks about a peace that passes all understanding. It's called the peace of God. That peace of God can only be found in Jesus. You can find rest, peace, when you live in Jesus' presence. You can find order, when you submit to his ways, you can find harmony when you reflect on his truth. You can find security when you trust in his promises. And you can find quietness when you rest in his timing. Peace is hard to come by, especially the peace of God. Here's a few scriptures on peace. Galatians 5, 22 says, the fruit of the Spirit is all those other things and peace. Romans 5, 1 says, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 14, verse 17, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, meaning it is not pizza and Mountain Dew but it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. What about Mr. Job in chapter 22, verse 21? Submit to God and be at peace with him, and this way prosperity will come to you. Romans 8, verse 6 says, to be carnally minded, to, to be focused on the flesh is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. John 16, Jesus said, I've told you these things 
not so that you might be afraid or fearful or anxious, but you're going to have trouble in this world. But I can tell you that I've said these things so that you might have peace because you shall overcome them. John 14, verse 27, Jesus said again to his disciples, he said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, so let not your heart be troubled or afraid. Peace is a pretty big deal when it comes to being a Christian. If you want to be a spirit-led person, you've got to be a peaceful-led person. So question number two, what is a peacemaker? A well, peacemaker comes from the Greek word irenopoios. All right, I do not speak Greek. I just know that that's the word, and this is what the word means. All right. What's more important is not that you can pronounce irenopoios. <laughs> What's more important, you know what it actually means. It means to bring together. A peacemaker means to bring together. A peacemaker says means to pursue harmony. To resolve disputes, to erase division, to reconcile differences, to eliminate strife, and to silence criticism. That's what it means. So Hebrews 12, 14 says, make every effort to do this. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone. Romans 12, 18 says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Can I say that it's a good idea that you learn to get along together? It's time that we all start to sing. We go together like Ramo Lama Lama to ding the ding dong. You know what I mean? We, we gotta be. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Sometimes things pop in my head and they don't make sense. <laughs> but God wants us together. He doesn't want us separate. He wants us to go together. He wants us to live together. He wants us to be in harmony with one another. It's a good idea that God's plan for your life, you say, well, what's God's plan for my life? God's plan for your life is that you get along with your spouse. God's plan for your life is that you get along with your children. God's plan for your life is that you make your marriage work. God's plan for your life is that you understand how to operate in your employment in a peaceful way. God's plan for your life is to do everything your pastor says. <laughs> Jim, you like that, don't you? No. <laughs> it's, it's living by a standard to refuse to fight and quarrel. To get your way. Amen? Amen? Matthew 5, verse 23 and 24, Jesus says, If you're offering a gift, then leave it at the altar. He, he says, Leave it at the altar, and remember that if you've got something against your brother or sister, leave it there and don't make it right with your brother and sister first. Does it? Doesn't he? Do you know what that means? Let me, let me give you, in other words, what that means. I love what Bill Kirk says it is. In other words, it's more important to God that your heart has a right relationship with people than if you gave a gift of over one million dollars. Mm -hmm. Wow. And all the trustees of the church say that was not a good statement, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> But it's true, that's what Jesus said. Now sometimes we confuse peacemaking with peacekeeping. Sometimes we confuse peacemaking with peacekeeping. Jesus did not say, blessed are the peacekeepers. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. John MacArthur says, as God sees it, peace is far more than the absence of something. It is the presence of righteousness that causes right relationships. Peace is not just stopping war. Peace is creating righteousness that brings enemies together in love. Right? And, and you say, well, that's just John MacArthur. Okay, what about God said in Proverbs 16, verse 7? 
When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. So why do we have such a war going on? We're going to get to that in a minute. Against those of us who are Christian. I want to say this. That here's a, the, big, the biggest difference between peacekeepers and peacemakers is this. Peacekeepers try to compromise. They avoid confrontation and conflict. They live by the motto, don't Rock the boat. They ignore everything and hope things go away. And they really don't care if the conflict ever gets resolved as long as it doesn't affect them. You know there's a lot of people, even here, some of you might even walk into church and you could care less what conflicts go on in the church as long as you have a quote-unquote peaceful time in the presence of God on Sunday. You could care less about what's going on on the other side of the room. That's not the peace that Jesus talked about. That's superficial. That's weak. That's not peace that transforms communities and cultures and the society in which we live. It's when we begin to make peace. Peacemakers are not compromising. They are confrontational. He said, wait a minute, I don't understand, Pastor. Did you know that confrontations to conflict are the doorways that lead to transformation? If we never confront the conflict, nothing will ever change. Here's a good statement. Truth without love is harsh, right? But love without truth is compromise. Jesus is mercy and truth. Peacemakers do not just let things go. Peacemakers confront. They don't allow it to fester. I remember a pastor told me, he said, if you think there's something going on in the church, if you have a feeling like there is, there is conflict with you or with your leadership or with, or with something that's going on, nip it in the bud right away. Confront it. Before it gets out of hand. Good leadership will always tell you that. Don't run away. Conflict is inevitable, church. It's going to happen. We live in a world where conflict is going to happen. and um, But conflict can stimulate dialogue. It can stimulate creativity. It can help us to begin to promote some change. And it makes life more interesting. Imagine if all of us looked the same, acted the same, thought the same, if we all liked the same kind of music, we all liked the same kind of things, we all wanted to watch the same kind of movies, and we all wanted to live the same kind of way. It'd get boring, wouldn't it? It's a good thing that we had differences of opinions and differences of perceptions. And so instead of avoiding those conflicts, peacemakers don't demand that everyone agrees with them but rather they rejoice in the diversity of the people in which they live, the community in which they live, all right? So here, peacemaking is super important. I want to just give you real quick, not going to go into a whole, whole detail of this, but the process of making peace. Have you ever, have you ever played that, that game, The King of the Mountain? Did you know when it comes to conflict, that's what we play? Everyone's trying to be the king of the mountain. They want to be on top of the mountain. They want to win the conflict. And there are three ways that everybody climbs that mountain. And there are those that will try to climb that mountain with aggression. They'll pull people down. They'll try to make their way. Then there are others who just avoid it all together until everybody slips down and then they'll go up, right? They're the people that just kind of walk away from the situation and say, all right, let that thing go away and then I'll reapproach it, you know? And then there are those who are peacemakers. We're either, when it comes to a conflict, we either attack or we escape, or we make peace. 
Now, the way we escape is this, is we will deny the presence of the conflict. Some of you husbands will just go down into your man cave or into wherever your place is, and you'll just pretend like you didn't have that big fight with your wife just a few minutes ago. And you will pretend that it did not exist, that it didn't happen, and you'll just go on, and for a moment, you'll have temporary relief, won't you? But it doesn't last forever until you come back into the kitchen and then it starts again. <laughs> Some of you will run away. You fight, you fly. Some of you say, this is just too difficult of a situation. This is what happens in a lot of marriages. This is what happens in jobs. And you say, this is just, there's too much conflict. There's too much going on. I'm just getting out, I'm getting out of Dodge. I think the grass is going to be greener on the other side. We all know that that's not true, but that some way, somehow, we deal with conflict. But that only delays what God really wants to do in your life. And the really the sad thing is that sometimes people will commit suicide to avoid the conflict. It will say everyone will be more at peace if I'm no longer around. Very sad moment, very sad thing. Did you know suicide is the third leading cause of teenagers in the United States? Do you know why? Because they think if they go away, maybe mom and dad will get it right. Oh, how sad. How sad. Blessed are the peacemakers. Now, some of us don't escape, but some of us attack. We go on the assault, and we use force, and we use intimidation and manipulation. Some of us, some women, you'll withhold, and I'm going to say it again, you'll withhold sex in order to get your husband to do what you want your husband to do. So the Bible says don't do that. And we can laugh about it, but it's true. We go on the manipulating side to try to get people to do what we want to do and so that we can be the king of the mountain. And we force our agenda. We force our ideas. This is what the, this is what the boss does at, the work, at work, doesn't he? He comes down and he, and he micromanages everything and tries to control everything and make you do exactly what he wants to do so that you know he's the boss. <laughs> what about... A few things like this, sometimes people feel like they got to go to court. Can I tell you a story that uh, is true? I had my house in Kaz for rent, and it was being rented by pastors. It was a, he was a pastor, and he was also the superintendent of schools. He cut his lease one year early, which we lost, Stacy and I lost over $20,000 because of that. In the moment, he was a brother in Christ, and his wife's mother was dying of cancer, and he said he needed to go back to Rochester, where they were from, and his church needed him back there, and he needed, he needed to cut the lease, and he asked for mercy. And I looked at him, and I said, brother, I understand, it's okay. It put me out 20 grand, but I made a decision for mercy, and I didn't take it to court. Now, my realtor said to me, and many people at work told Stacy, you should take them to court. You can get your money. See, that's sometimes how people go after things. They, they want to be king of the mountain. And they'll take people to court and bleed them dry. This is what happens in divorce all the time, isn't it? Do you know that there are some people who will stay married to individuals for a certain amount of time only so that when they go and divorce them, they will have to they will take that husband's retirement mm -hmm. because they lived with him for such, they were married for just the right amount of time so that now they are, they are uh, able to take all of that. That is called manipulation, attack, and litigation that is not peacemaking. Say, Pastor, this is serious stuff. This is real. 
This is why part of the Beatitudes, Jesus said, blessed are they who are peacemakers. Do you know some people will murder others? Chicago, even Syracuse. I, I mean, how many times do we see people getting murdered all the time? Why are they getting murdered? Why are they getting murdered? Someone's not king of the mountain, and they got to take someone out so that they can climb. And you say, well, I would never shoot anybody. I would never stab anybody. How about in their back with your words? How about, how about a shot of unforgiveness in the heart? Jesus said murder isn't just physical. It's when you hold bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart towards people. So how do we make peace? What is the process of making peace? Overlook the offense. Proverbs 19.11 says, A person's wisdom makes him slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. It is a glorious thing. It is a worshipful thing. It is a spiritual thing for you not to deny it or to walk away from it, but to overlook it and to say it's okay. Praise God for those that do that for us, for the wise people. Reconciliation. Confess. Correct. Forgive. Matthew 18, 15 says, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault. And when the two of you are alone, if he listens to you, you've regained your brother. Listen, church, reconciliation is what we're all about. Ministers of reconciliation, God has called us, has called us to be. Negotiation. Now listen, sometimes there needs to be a settlement between two people. Sometimes you got to work out a negotiation. you got to put everything, all your cards on the table, and you say, all right, what is going to work out best for both parties? And you got to negotiate. That's why Jesus said in Philippians 2.4, or the Bible says, Paul said, each of you should be concerned not about your own interests, but about the interests of others as well. Peacemaking are people who sit down and have a civil conversation with one another and say, All right, how are we both going to win today? How are we both going to win? How can, how can we have a win-win situation here? Now, our country does not demonstrate that. That's why the church has to demonstrate it. You know the only way that we have a win-win? is when love triumphs over selfishness. Amen. I'm going to tell you, I, I mean, I know I've talked a lot because I've shared the vision. I hope you're listening to this message because it is so important in which the day we live today. So important. Last one is a process of making peace is mediation. Sometimes it is so heated and there is so much involved in the conflict. There is so much going on between the two, between the parties, between the families, between the husband and the wife. There needs to be mediation, meaning we need to ask somebody to come in and have an objective look at this thing. Sometimes it's almost impossible for, for people to get it and negotiate and make it make a deal so that they can have peace. And sometimes you gotta ask somebody in. Maybe that's where you're at today. I think I just want to share. Maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you feel like I just keep coming up against a brick wall and I can't figure out how to bring peace into the situation. You might have to ask somebody to step in and look at your life from an objective standpoint. The Bible says that there is wisdom in many counselors. I have always, always talk to pastors. In fact, this week I had a pastor's meeting. Pastor Kevin and I went to a pastor's meeting and um, I haven't talked with a lot of the, the leaders in a long time and it came out and came out and said, well, I figured I'd show face at the pastor's meeting and uh, because I wanted you to know that I'm still alive, so I came out of my turtle shell. <laughs> they laughed and I said, um, but you know, things are pretty tough right now. And I talked to two pastors and I uh, committed to both of them, and I'm going to go and talk with them about my situation. 
It's not that I have a heated conflict within my, my home or with my family. It's just that I don't have peace like I know I should, that I want. And I, and I keep running up against a brick wall. I say, God, how is it going to, how, how do I do this? And sometimes we try to figure it out and we try to negotiate a plan and it never works. So therefore, ask somebody to come in and look at your life. That's what Kazon is all about. Kazon is all about, you know, I just feel like I'm just going round and round in circles and I just don't have the peace that I want. And you're going to come on Tuesday and you're going to allow me and you're going to allow Pastor Kevin and you're going to allow the writer of the book, Craig Rochelle, to be able to speak objectively into your life in a way that might help you find the peace that you're looking for. Now, I want to quickly move as I close today to the results of peacemaking. Don't you love how Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be what? Sons of God. And there are some versions that say children of God, but I want to say sons of God because it paints a different kind of picture, just a little bit different kind of picture. Sons receive something. They reflect something. And there are three results of being a son of God. When you are called a son of God, that means you've been reconciled to God. That means you also reflect your heavenly father. And it also means that you've received an inheritance. Those three things. And let me close by just encouraging you with these three things. If you make peace for no other reason than this, that you silence the voice of the accuser over your life. The enemy has done nothing but try to steal, kill, and destroy your peace, and destroy your life. He wants to take you away from God. He wants to separate you from God. Do these things. Submit to God and resist the devil. James says, and that's how you find peace, because that you will come into the fold. You'll come into the family. I also want to share about reflecting peace. Transferring peace. If you're a son of God, my children reflect who I am, don't they? You say, oh, Luke looks just like his father, or you know, Jacob runs around the church like his father. You know, I mean, you know, it's we reflect, our children reflect us as parents. And when you are called a son of God, that means you reflect him. If God is a God of peace, if his spirit is a spirit of peace, then you reflect peace. You don't, you don't. Become a peacemaker to become a son of God. When you become a son of God, you become a peacemaker. You want to know if you're in the family of God, if you want to know if you're saved, if you want to know that you've been transformed and that you've got a new life, ask yourself, am I making peace? Am I reflecting peace? Because if you are, then most likely God has transformed your life. Ask yourself these questions when you leave a conversation. Does the person feel like they've had a breath of fresh air? Or do they feel like they're suffocating? Peacemakers produce oxygen into others and into their lives so that they can breathe. And lastly, this, you'll receive an inheritance. There is a Hebrew word called shalom. There's a Hebrew word called shalom, and that refers to the word peace. Many times people will say shalom, right? Shalom in Hebrew, just in a nutshell, actually means to pay in advance peace. So you ask, well, what's being paid for? Your relationship with God. God paid for your peace. Thank you, Lord. 
And so I close by recurring and saying the same thing. We don't have to look around to see that the war is raging around us. There is a political war, isn't that? Democrats fighting against Republicans, the House fighting against the Senate, protesters fighting against Trump. There is a political war. There is a social war. I saw, and I'm gonna talk about this next week a little bit more, but I saw in 2020 a story about a homosexual girl who was forced by her parents to go to a camp, a Christian camp, to help her deal with her identity. And the whole 20 to 20 episode was geared towards how Christians are intolerant of homosexuality. And they painted a very gruesome picture of us, that we are so forceful and, and so controlling of people. There is a social war. The world is at war with Christians. And the world is at war with God. There is a social war. And we know that there is a religious war raging. We have many religions all throughout, all throughout our land, but we know that Islam is one major religion that is getting its ground and taking charge of the world today. And it is at war, not against Hinduism, not against Buddhism, not, it's not at war, Islam is not at war against um, atheism and agnosticism. Islam is not against homo homosexuality, so to speak, in some cases, Islam is not at war with anyone but Christians. And the more we say as a nation we're not a Christian nation, the less, I believe, terror will happen in our land. And it will be a temptation to say, let's keep peace with our Islam brothers so that we can keep our nation sane. Blessed are they who are persecuted, for they shall see the kingdom of God. Listen, church, this leads into the final beatitude, and it is this. There is a war raging against you and against all that you stand for if you are a Christian. But we are not at war with them. We have not waged war with them, so we know the war is over. They can keep fighting and fighting and fighting. That homosexual girl can continue to fight. 2020 can continue to fight. Islamic people can continue to fight. The Republicans can continue to fight. Democrats can continue to fight. But we, as Christians, can rest in victory. The war is over. And if we don't get that, we will not see revival. You say, Pastor, shouldn't we fight for those, those aborted babies? Shouldn't we fight for the conservative movement in our political world? I think eternal matters are so much more weighty than our political uh, scope today. Stop fighting a war that you did not start and start celebrating the victory that was won on the cross. Yeah. Yeah. Love has won. Yeah. 